Thank you so very much on behalf of Kairos Canada. It's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to our workshop. I am Jane Thiriqua. I'm the Global Partnerships Coordinator here at Kairos. I would like to begin this meeting today with a territorial acknowledgement um, to acknowledge that before we begin, uh, we are meeting today on the traditional territories of the indigenous people across Turtle Island. We thank them for allowing us to meet and learn together on their territories. To the original caretakers of this land of which we stand, I acknowledge the land of the Huron Wendat, Seneca and Mississaugas of the Credit Indigenous Peoples, the dish with one spoon territory where I am right now. To all that was here for thousands of years before us across Turtle Island, we honor the struggles and the lives of those who gave themselves for it. For those here today, we acknowledge the ancestors beneath our feet, we acknowledge the land. Our ears to the ground, we can hear them. The Cree, the Métis, the Dene, the Soto and Anishinaabe, the Dakota and Lakota nations, the Inuit, the Blackfoot, the Inu, and all nations that came before us and those yet to become an infinity of footsteps of those who long called this land home, the unfolding of bundles, the undoing of colonization and the opening of this land to allow treaty to come alive. We affirm our relationship to each other and to the land. We acknowledge and pay respects to the indigenous peoples, to the indigenous na nations and ancestors of this land. I acknowledge the land of the land of the Huron Wendat Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit Indigenous Peoples, where I am right now. Um, I will be co-moderating this workshop today with uh, my um, uh, colleagues at Kairos Canada, um, with Rachel Warden, who's here with us today, um, and with Gabriela Jimenez, who is the Latin America um, Partnerships Coordinator and also with Radia Meng, um, who is the uh, our uh, global partnerships coordinator, uh, Africa and climate justice. Um, so I want to thank you, uh, my colleagues here, uh, and we hope that we are going to have uh, an amazing discussion for today. So for uh, those of you who are new to Kairos. Um, Kairos Canada is, uh, has a long history of working in partnerships with uh, women, um, uh, with women organizations and movements in Canada uh, and uh, in internationally as well, particularly in countries that have experienced prolonged conflict. Uh, for over 10 years, the Kairos Women of Courage program has developed into an innovative partner-led and transformative initiative, working with women-led organizations in Africa, in Asia, um, in uh, the Middle East and in Canada. On issues, on, on issues of women, peace and security and the gendered impacts of resource extraction. The program continues to enable Kairos and its partner organizations to successfully implement projects that are directly, um, that directly respond to gender-based violence, address the impacts of women to protect human rights and the environment. Today, we are also very honored to have with us a panel of women whom we highly respect and have the great pleasure of knowing and working with here today at Kairos. Um, and I would like to introduce you all to um, our panelists for today. Um, we begin with uh, Sherry Pictou. Dr. Sherry Pictou is um, a Mi'kmaq woman from Litsuktu water cuts through high rocks known as Bear River First Nation, Nova Scotia. She is an assistant professor uh, in the fac faculties of law and management at Dalhousie University, focusing on indigenous governance. Dr. Pictou is also a former chief for her community and the former co-chair of the World Forum of Fisher People. She's a member of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Task Force on Indigenous and Local Knowledge. Her research interests include decolonizing treaty relations, social justice for Indigenous women, Indigenous women's role in food and life ways, and Indigenous governance. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pitu, for being with us today and welcome. 
Next, we have Chantal Bilulu, who is the project manager for Women, Peace and Security at Retier de la Justice in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. She has eight years experience defending, protecting and promoting human rights with her Retier de la Justice. She has participated in and organized trainings on women's rights, popularization of laws and other legal instruments, and participated in advocacy actions carried out by civil society actors with government authorities for a change in policies vis-a-vis -vis the rights of the population. In her work, Chantal also accompanies survivors of sexual violence and is involved in their paralegal training for their care. We also have with us today, Natalia Atsunuk. She is a Maya Kichakel woman and a victim and survivor of the Guatemala armed conflict. She has been part of the social movement in Guatemala for over 30 years. She holds a Bachelor of Law and uh, Social Sciences. Her areas of expertise are human rights, indigenous people's rights, food sovereignty, land and environmental defense, economic justice, climate justice, and free trade agreements. She is committed to social and gender justice. Natalia is a member of the Association of Kahi Akhop and the Movement of Women with Constitutional Power. She was an honorary witness for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. And lastly, in absentia, but on um, uh, pre-recorded video, Beverly Longhead is currently the International Solidarity Officer at Catribo um, in the Philippines. She also acts as the coordinator of Indigenous Peoples Movements for, for Self-Determination and Liberation of the Philippines. She is an Igora belonging to the Bontok Pane. Pancayes uh, of Sagada and Alba Bontoc, Mountain Province of Philippines. Um, I'm sorry for uh, my mispronunciation. I'm doing the best that I can. Um, and Beverly has a background in law and has been a long-standing advocate for youth and for indigenous peoples in the Philippines and abroad through her active role in social movements and human rights organizations. Beverly has also um, been a member and officer of the Cordillera People Alliance, uh, CPA since 1992, serving as Education Commission staff, Deputy Secretary General and Chairperson. She is now a member of the CPA's Regional Advisory Council. Beverly was part of the planning team for the International People's Conference on Mining in, 20, uh, in 2015, and she was also a delegate at the International Gathering of Women Against extract Extractivism in Montreal, in Canada in um, 2018. We thank all of our panelists today. Thank you so very much um, for being here with us today. So today's discussion will be shipped around a series of questions that uh, will be asked to the panelists, and we will also try to include your questions. Uh, so you can also add, the, add them and put them uh, in the chat, and we will try to raise these questions. Um, so to set the pace, as the impacts of climate change become even more clear, the crisis is acting as a risk multiplier for conflict and security across the world, increasing risks direct, directly through displacement, economic shocks, uh, natural disasters, and rapid changes in, um, in livelihoods. Responses requires a transformational approach or approaches based on innovative solutions and inclusive policies including with respect to gender. Um, understanding of the gender dimensions of the climate crisis is promising, yes. Um, and while there has been research on its differential impacts on men and women, as well as the um, exclusion of women uh, from decision-making on climate change, major gaps still remain, including with respect to security as well. In many fragile and conflict-affected states, Climate change endangers efforts to secure peace and security while deepening gender inequalities. Women often bear the brunt of conflict over land and natural resources, um, climate-related displacement, and gender-based violence. And we know that every conflict is unique, but women's organizations and their leaders are always at the forefront of issues ranging from peace building, conflict resolution, post-conflict recovery, and economic recovery, to climate mitigation and environmental protection. Usually they are unsupported and under-resourced, but women peace, uh, peace builders risk their lives um, and make tremendous sacrifices in order to rebuild their communities and to forge a better future for their societies. Um, 
despite some gains that have been made um, in ensuring that the recognition and participation of women in policy and decision making, there continues to be a persistent lack of progress in women's representation and leadership across the board on the climate mitigation, on women, peace and security, on environmental and economic recovery and employing a gender responsive approach or approaches to policy um, and planning cannot however, however be guaranteed through increased representation of women alone. There are other important support mechanisms, both through traditional indigenous and local support, through allocation of funding streams and through gender focused analysis um, and these are just some of the examples. So not to preempt our panelists' perspectives on these issues, it is my pleasure to welcome our first speaker, um, Dr. Sherry Pictou, to start us off. Dr. Pictou, um, from your perspectives in activism, from academic scholarship, from local community engagement, can you speak to the context of the impact of militarized conflict, uh, the climate crisis, economic injustice and resulting insecurities and gender-based violence in your territory and others. Yes, uh, welcome everyone. And um, I'm speaking to you from my ancestor homelands, Mi'kma'ki, or the part of Mi'kma'ki known as Nova Scotia. I'm so honored to be here, particularly with such powerful and strong women. Um, it, it's such an honor to be here. Now, this is a loaded question to try to answer in just a few minutes. So I'm just going to just uh, provide a few brief points because I, I think I'll end up repeating myself throughout this panel. But one of the things I was thinking about when I was thinking about this particular question, I think as Indigenous women, particularly for Indigenous women or as an Indigenous person, but particularly as women, um, this has this becomes a lifelong struggle. And I started as a little girl uh, because I, I was very fortunate to have a grandmother who was very strong. And she, um, despite that we were not allowed to run in elections for chief and council, as we know here in uh, Canada, she became chief in the middle 70s. And so from a, from a, as a little girl, I, it was instilled in me, you know, how strong ind uh, Indigenous women's uh, was, how strong we are, I, I suppose I should say, and what our struggles were. And so it was instilled on in me that we had lost these vast access to these vast ancestral homelands. And so my struggle in terms of human rights, indigenous rights, environmental rights uh, has been throughout my whole life when I was thinking about this in one way or another. And um, all of these is a part of being Indigenous. And I recall uh, here in Nova Scotia, we have an African Nova Scotian activist. Her name is Lynn Jones. And I remember her speaking to uh, a group of young activists one time. And she said, you call it activism. I call it survival. And that really struck with me because activism sometimes is a privilege for some and for, but for many indigenous women, it isn't. And, but I would like to think that we're on a verge now of the resurgence of our, of, uh, of who we are as a people and, um, and that we're resilient. And so some of the um, issues that uh, we've experienced here in, Canada and particularly in, in, in from my own perspective as being a Mi'kmaq woman is that you win some rights in the court system and we've won treaty rights. We know we have Indigenous rights. We're now struggling with uni the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and so forth. However, unfortunately, when you win those particular rights, even if you're successful in a struggle, there always seems to be this process of trying to assimilate Indigenous people into this very uh, neoliberal, and what I mean by that very progressive economic development model at uh, large scales, like industrial models, as a way to try to address rights or the inequities. And 
and it's such a major contradiction for me personally, because why would you want to be a part of a process that um, causes inequity to begin with? And then um, I will sum up by saying that, unfortunately, that model is being forced on Indigenous people here in Canada and around the world. And what we are experiencing with that model is extreme levels of violence. It exaggerates violence, not only against uh, our environment, because a lot of times, a lot those industrial models are not sustainable a lot of the time, but also against the bodies of Indigenous women and two-spirited LGBTQ plus people. And this has been proven and why this, there's many reasons for this, but it seems that there's an escalation of the violence. It's not, it doesn't, um, it doesn't account for Development doesn't account for all of the violence, but a great proportion of the violence against the land, against the waters, and against bodies is attributed to these unsustainable forms of development, particularly in the resource extraction um, industry. And um, a lot of this has to do how our national economies are tied into the global economies. And I say global because this is, happens here, but as um, I'll probably elaborate later on, we and, and my colleagues will, or the panelists here will, is that uh, we struggle here with Canadian companies, particularly mining companies, but in other sectors too, and the atrocities that they commit and the violence that they commit in other parts of the world. And so they're really interlinked. And for me, this struggle is multi scalier on multi scales from the local right up to the global. So all of my life, uh, I've been struggling to secure access to our ancestral homelands for food and water, livelihood, and even more so to protect them. And I've experienced with treaty fishing rights, fishing issues, access to water, uh, a lot of environmental issues that is caused by industrial development, pollution, and so forth. And more recently, um, I have found myself in uh, the role of trying to facilitate or open up spaces so that Indigenous women can have a voice. And so that's basically my experience, uh, a bird's eye view, a very quick view into that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, um, Sherry, for, for sharing that with us. Um, we'll now move to uh, our next speaker, um, Chantal, uh, who will be introduced to us by Radia. Uh, merci beaucoup, uh, Dr. Pictou, pour votre intervention très importante sur l'importance. Thank you for your intervention. You gave us different examples of sustainable development. And now we are going to speak about the Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo. Thank you, Chantal. Notre première question pour vous est pouvez-vous nous parler de la question is, could you de la dégradation de l'environnement et de la violence à l'égard de la Et selon vous, pourquoi la majorité des femmes s'implique moins dans l'environnement et de la catastrophe? Merci beaucoup. What could you tell us about this catastrophe? The interpreter excuses, but the quality of the audio was very weak. Um, very glad to be with you tonight and to participate once more to these meetings. If I uh, understood well the question of Radia, Radia wanted to say, how do we have degradation in our environment after climate perturbations? And why are women participating less in the decision 
uh, making in climate action? Is it the question? Uh, yes, this was the question. Could, I was wondering if you could speak about the cli climate action in uh, DRC and about the uh, mine exploitation. And I wanted you to give us a perspective on uh, women, how they're involved in this and what's their condition. Thank you. Okay. As we all know, global warming has direct consequences um, globally. And uh, uh, DRC hasn't been spared. And uh, I'm actually currently speaking from the eastern part of uh, DRC. I wanted to tell you that global warming also has consequences. And these consequences are, have as an origin deforestation. This is to say that the excessive cutting of trees by foreign companies don't respect the right of indigenous people and degrades the environment. Because when these mine exploiters do this industrially, they throw acids and other uh, chemicals that they use to clean the minerals in the environment. So they waste water currents. And when this waste is in water flows, when it rains, these chemicals get into our fields, the fields of our humble citizens. And these uh, fields are 90% exploited by women. And this makes women even poorer. A woman that lives out of her work in the field cannot make her family eat because there are toxic ways in the field. Something else um, is also important to mention that is a product of global warming. That is to say the mismanagement of chemicals, chemical waste. I want to say that there is also an effect of the um, bad uh, mismanagement of uh, electrical appliances uh, waste and uh, also the problem of uh, packagings, uh, the uh, tins um, that are not degradable. There are also the bags the the everything we buy in the supermarket everything we use even though if we put them in a, a bags a bag so that the um, waste disposal companies uh, uh, take them there is nowhere where they can put this uh, dispose this way if, so that it can be disposed properly. And so this means that all the bottles of water, of juice, of grenadine, of whatever bottle we're talking about, these bottles end up in the river. And uh, I also talk about the lake here in Sikivu. Kivu Ki Lake is very polluted by these bottles right now. Many bottles are in the lake. And actually, uh, fish use these uh, bottles. In, and this also entails a, a lowering of fish. So fishermen earn less. 
and this causes uh, a lot of fame. So the fact that the water, the water is polluted. And I talk about this and I observe the same situation of bottles other, uh, elsewhere in Africa I also was in Sudan last year and I also saw the, uh, these bottles. I don't know whether you have bottles uh, polluting in Northern Africa, but I saw them in Sudan as well. And bottles are polluting the rivers and this uh, diminishes the fish production. Another element that I wanted to mention is the fact that seasons are not well defined anymore. We don't know whether they're, they're, it's a rain season or a dry season. We don't know anymore when to harvest, when to um, so. Uh, so in February, for instance, we had a small season of drought. The interpreter apologizes, but the connection is very bad. And sometimes we also saw uh, containers polluting. Okay, je pense que nous avons perdu Chantal. I think we lost Chantal. She, we're going to reach her out later. Thank you for this uh, speech, Chantal. She spoke about the impact of climate change uh, in uh, DRC, speaking about the river and the waste in the river and its impact on the economics. Thank you. Vamos a proceder ahora con Natalia Atsunu, que nos acompaña. Now we're going to move on. Que nos acompaña desde Natalia, and she is in Guatemala. Estamos esperando, espera un poco para, para verla. We're going to wait a few minutes or a few seconds for Natalia to turn on her camera. Entonces, comenzamos mientras mientras se eh, nos acompaña Nati. Pero bueno, buenos días a todos y a Nati por acompañarnos. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you, Nati, for joining us today. It's always an honor to be able to collaborate with you and to learn from everything that you share with us in terms of your wisdom and your experiences. You have participated in social movements for more than 30 years as a defender of human rights, a land defender, in order to build peace that includes indigenous peoples and women's perspectives in Guatemala. Now, thinking about that experience, could you please speak to us about how the militarized conflict, the climate crisis, and the economic precarity not only contribute to gender violence, but also intensify that violence. Thank you so much, Gabriela. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you also for inviting me to participate in this panel. As was already said, these topics are very complex. For many years, there have, there have been wars throughout the world as a result of economic interests. And currently, we're seeing an increased militarization in our territory. And this is closely connected to the global economy, mining companies, hydro dams, and other sources of exploitation. For the Mayan people, Defending our territory is one of our priorities. It's defending life itself. Defending, for example, human rights, defending life. And here we're referring to all of life because human beings need air, water, nature, and all of biodiversity that is part of mother nature. 
la defensa de esos bienes naturales ha significado la Our environment has also led to the criminalization of members of our community, including women. We've also seen the militarization of our territories and our communities. And their goal is to control and to have power. And they work closely with these transnational companies to exercise that power over our communities. We've also seen, for example, abuse and sexual violence against women. Para nosotros es importante la lucha por la defensa de la vida o la defensa del territorio que le llamamos, como decía. Our fight to defend land, territory, and life is fundamental for us. We want to defend and protect life and rights, but not only human rights, but also nature's rights, because that's what gives us life. We're inspired by four elements that give us life, air, water, fire, and land. Everything is connected, and it all gives us life. Our perspective of Mother Nature and of territory is very inclusive and very broad. We've seen increased militarization in our territories. Women, our men, are criminalized for their work defending life. There's also the issue of climate change. Indigenous communities have taken care of nature. We're guardians of Mother Nature. And indigenous communities usually live in rural areas or in mountains. It's our life. The impact of climate change affect us much more directly because we live in rural areas. We experience natural disasters, flooding, and all the different consequences of climate change. That's something that concerns me deeply. When we look at the statistics, more than 80% of the victims of climate change are women. And the destruction perpetrated by transnational companies, they create a lot of pollution. On one hand, we're protecting and defending our territory, but at the same time, these transnational companies are creating pollution and contributing to climate change. But at the end of the day, we're the ones who are defending and protecting, fighting for our territory and who are protecting Mother Nature. And we're the ones who suffer the greatest impacts of climate change. This is a great challenge that we face, that the indigenous communities face to protect and defend life in our territories. Thank you so much, Nati. Thank you for your comments. And it's clear there's a question that comes up for me when I listen to your response. What is, what is peace in this context of extractive industries that pollute territories? Who is the coordinator of the International Indigenous Peoples Movement for Self-Determination and Liberation? which is based out of the Philippines. Her interventions were pre-recorded due to the time difference. Um, so we will be watching a video now. Take it away, Jane.
um, thank you. Thank you for for joining us. And um, it's such an honor to have you have you here all the way from the Philippines. And um, I guess the first question is a kind of around the overall context regarding these impacts, the nexus of the impacts of climate, the climate, climate crisis and when peace and security and gender equality. So from your um, extensive experience as a woman peace builder, a human rights defender, land defender, environmental activist, um, what are the intersecting impacts of militarized, militarized conflict, cr climate crisis and economic justice from your experience and, and the resulting insecurity and gender-based violence in, in the Philippines and the communities you work with? Um, thank you, um, Rachel, um, but uh, happy International Working Women's Day to you and to all of our participants in this um, side event, in this uh, workshop. And of course, thank you, uh, Kairos and all the organizers for inviting me to be part of this um, forum. Um, you know, Rachel, I've been an, an activist uh, since uh, I was in high school. <laughs> uh, as young as that, uh, I was exposed to some realities uh, in the region at that time, uh, which was still under um, martial law. No? Um, and then, of course, later on in the university, I became more active in, uh, in the uh, youth and students organization. And when I graduated, I joined the Cordillera People's Alliance, which is um, uh, a regional organization of indigenous peoples here in the Cordillera in the Philippines. And I've worked specifically in providing um, education and training for community and people's uh, organization. Um, later on, I would uh, further develop that uh, capacity by pro providing you know, paralegal and human rights services. So in that kind of work, I, I traveled in many of the far-flung villages in the region, and of course, also in other regions uh, in the country. And then now with my current um, position as global coordinator, I also had the opportunity to visit many indigenous communities in different parts of, uh, of the world no i've been to to burma and, uh, i mean even in this uh, so-called uh, conflict areas and i've noticed um, many things that are um similar uh one uh i have seen i have also felt what we call the the destruction of the climate uh, of the environment i mean and of course the what we call as um, climate change no things uh, i know uh i have seen like in uh, the province where i come from the frequency of forest fires um the growing lack of water <laughs> for drinking for domestic and um, agricultural um, um agricultural use and this has increased the the burden of uh, of uh, of women wherein many of us are responsible in uh, providing um, food you know, on the table of our families. And at the same time, it has also doubled the burden in terms of our role in agricultural um, production, which is the main livelihood of uh, indigenous women. And in all of this also, I've seen that much of these climate um, issues or uh, what you call these um, concerns that indigenous peoples and indigenous women are facing would re revolve around the issue of land, no? um, the, the, uh, the increasing um, displacement brought about by large scale mining and energy projects, the continuing expansion of uh, commercial monocrop um, production, and then of course now the growing land use um, conversion for infrastructure and real estate um, development. No? So these have all uh, affected women in the terms of they are also displaced together with their families from their ancestral lands and the uh, traditional um, lands. Then as I mentioned, it has doubled the, the burden. Um, third, when they are displaced, they are forced to move to probably the town centers and the cities in the discrimination that we feel 
brought about by our um, indigeneity is probably uh, probably double. And then when we fight or protest these destructive projects, um, we are what you call is faced in a higher risk position. We're in, uh, if we uh, have seen experiences of indigenous women uh, getting arrested because of trump up charges, and there are no specific what you call these um, facilities that would separate um, women detainees from men detainees. Two, we are, as women ourselves, and probably because of uh, the lack of understanding or knowledge of how the judicial um, system works, we are put in a position wherein we are either forced to compromise uh, our rights uh, and even our welfare in, in that position. Um, in the case of indigenous peoples, in situations of protests, most of our communities are militarized. And that puts, again, another um, additional burden, additional risk for indigenous women in terms of rape, sexual violence, sexual uh, assault, and other forms of violations or violence against women by virtue of our gender. But being indigenous itself, you know, it makes it uh, double or, or triple. So like many, I think, would mention, as indigenous women, we suffer or experience um, violations or issues brought about by us being women. But we, this is also coupled with issues that are particular uh, with us because we are indigenous. So the issues of discrimination, the issues of uh, neglect. No? So I think these are the things that I have uh, seen um, through the years. And I myself, I have experienced that in the case of the Philippines, where in not only is my organizations that I'm affiliated with um, red tagged or vilified uh, or declared as persona non grata because of this uh, uh, involvement. No? And uh, uh, in 2018, I was part of that uh, list where in the Department of Justice of the Philippine government filed a petition to declare us as, uh, as terrorists. That's why at that time, up to now, we have launched a campaign that um, human rights um, activists uh, are, not, uh, are not terrorists. It, and it's also part of a campaign to stop the criminalization of um, dissent or resistance uh, or the assertion of uh, our rights as indigenous peoples and, of course, as, uh, as women. Merci beaucoup. Uh... Pour cette contribution très importante sur la vie des femmes. Thank you very much for this contribution about women and and their rights. Thank you very much, our panelists, to talk about the uh, consequences of minority extraction on their territories. Now we go back to Congo, and we have a question for uh, Chantal. What is your experience as a peace builder, as woman? But what is the impact of women, traditional women in Congo, also for the economization in the context of the, uh, the reduction of climate change and to prevent catastrophes? Thank you very much, Chantal. Chantal, nous vous écoutons par rapport à votre réponse sur la question. Yes, please, go ahead. Thank you very much. If I have to talk about, about my experience as a defender for women's rights, what I, what I can say is that I've been working in the battle against climate change and, and climate mitigation. I did some activities and we're these were centered on human and women uh, education. And these activities were, were all about uh, awareness and, and sensibilization about women and 
and how we can protect uh, the environment and how we can combat climate change. And these activities has taught us a lot of things, but we have also specific points that are focused on women because we have we can define the women as women and we also thought about the consequences about climate changes on women and these sessions of awareness we are doing it in different classrooms during also some radio radio um, programs about also the effects of deforestation we are bringing the population to plant new trees, but also we are also talking about waste management and how we can manage plastic in order to reduce pollution. And in, in the house, who who is in charge of taking uh, the waste and go and dispose them we tried to to find in the population and talk with them and we were disposing the waste but this was a, a source of conflicts in the different uh, villages and we had some problems with the public authorities and the, the and the authorities and also the landowners were in, engaged we ask also uh, to the authorities to not allow the selling of parcels, the selling parcels that can prevent, that can be helpful normally with the construction. We have a lot of issues with the services. We have some authorities that suspending it. And this is all regards public services. And we always cut trees and we build houses. But it's not sustainable because we cut the trees and we built some house that were not in the right place. So, and then they fell out. We are trying to remember to the population that we need always to plant trees. Without trees, we don't have any life. We done our in our work with the Ministry of Justice. We are trying to apply law in, in our activities. We have the engagement of the community, of course, and these women. We gave them a lot of information to self-aware them. And interpreter excuses itself, but there are some connections problem. And the uh, plant. So the pig species can be the good fertilizers. So we ask not to throw out, out, away the waste coming from the food. Of course, not the plastic. If it wasn't consumed in the family, we can put it in an apart of our house in a basin, and then we throw all the wastes, the, the, for example, the rest of the of vegetables, but also the meat, what we didn't uh, eat, and we keep them. And this uh, waste will be mixed 
in, in a compass, and this will be mixed with the pig's feces in order to uh, help the soil as fertilizer. This is what we are doing to fight climate change. We are also uh, working with the authorities and show them uh, them that is uh, that since a lot of people cut the trees, we don't have any more trees, and all the roads are without trees. We have a lot of rains, and a lot of women come to the city in order to sell their vegetables. And she cannot participate anymore to the life of the family. And, and if I if I have to talk about the impacts about on women and young girls, the women is always considered as a series B. She she has always to be under a man. And she has always to be with a boy that would be her guardian. And the woman, in order to fight climate change and also uh, climate perturbation, the women, woman doesn't have any trees. So it's the man that is the proprietary of the tree. And also, he's the owner but it's the woman but it's the it's the it's the it's the man it's the his it's her maybe the father or brother that owns the tree but it's not the woman itself and this is the the culture and then she cannot cannot cut the trees as well because the woman is not the owner of the trees, but it's the man that cut the uh, the tree. And the woman cannot say anything because we always say that she cannot, she cannot compare with the man. She never grows up. All these themes are in order to that these women will stop this deforestation. We are in front of a big problem. If the women will stop deforestation, this will not be long lasting because we don't have any gas at home for preparing like, for example, the food. And a lot of people that in the we, we use the wood to prepare and to warm our food. And we ask ourselves, the woman has some difficulties. She's not the owner of the tree. And she can say she has to protect the environment. The man, she, he says that he cuts the tree in order to, to gain some money. So we have some issues between men and women because the man is the manager is the owner he is the producer of the wood at this point the woman she's poor she doesn't have any trees and she has some difficulties and, and, she, and she cannot say that she doesn't want that the trees will be cut. She has issues in expressing herself. Thank you very much, Chantal. Thank you very much for your intervention. I think yours was very interesting and in how um, the, your tradition is implied. Thank you very much, Radia. Thank you. Hey Chantal, thank you, Radia. Uh, very insightful. Um, so I'd like to welcome again uh, Dr. Pictou um, 
and ask like in many contexts uh, gender based violence is directly uh, is directed um, with impunity against women women human rights defenders and environmental defenders to silence and also to deter them um, and some of the work that you have done has highlighted that the indigenous worldview is uh, often neglected it's excluded and often distorted as well can you share with us some of your work um, and the linkages between the climate crisis, gender-based violence on women and indigenous women in particular? Again, I don't know where to start with any of that um, because it's just so complex and so heavy, but uh, one of the things I've noticed here in uh, Canada, so-called Canada, is that um, as some of our previous speakers have uh, have also spoken about is that um, women, particularly indigenous women, um, have been taking the front, taking the lead in trying to protect sources of food and water and basically their land and, and this extends to the waters as well. And I often ask why that is, uh, because we have like 400 to 500 years of colonialism here, and, it's, and we have contemporary forms of colonialism, and we have the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls that are um, at great rates that's happening across this country. And why are they going missing? Why are they going murdered? And as I had said earlier, that some of this has been attributed to um, the way that land is being exploited and particularly for uh, corporate, um, corporate needs, the profit sector, and particularly in resource extraction, all kinds of resource extraction, including mining and the extraction of fish, the extraction and so forth. And though we have what we call here in Canada Aboriginal and treaty rights, though those rights are supposed to be protected under the constitution, though in my case for Mi'kmaq, we have the peace and friendship treaties where there is never no land uh, given up. We were supposed to be able to fish, to hunt and gather as usual. And of course that never happened. And though we though uh, we win these rights, this hyper intensive extractive industry seems to supersede those rights and move forward at at, at um, the expense of environmental sustainability and of course of our indigenous survival. And so why is that happening? And particularly in Canada, when we have a duty to consult Indigenous people, there's a legal duty to consult Indigenous people. Yet, when that happens, Indigenous women are left out of that consultation process. It usually happens from the very top to the leadership. And so my work now is about how do we include Indigenous women and two-spirited and LGBTQ plus people? How do we include them? How are they consulted? There's some work being done in other communities of how do we have community-based consultation? Because as it is now that... Um, as it stands now, they are not consulted. And it will stop at the leadership. And the leadership is also um, is, is bound by corporate law to protect the confidentiality. There's no mechanism in this duty to consult to consult your own people. So subsequently what happens is when women go to defend their land and territories against what usually is unsustainable development, or there's a risk to the fish, or there's a risk to polluting the rivers and so forth. 
they are the first to be criminalized as some of my co-panelists have alluded to. In this country, the corporate law through the terms of injunctions will stop and violently remove women from trying to protect their land and water at all costs to, to let that development to go ahead. And we've seen it. We've seen it in British Columbia against the pipelines. We have seen this throughout history. Uh, here in my own territory, there were three humble, beautiful Mi'kmaq grandmothers. They were arrested. And so my question is, number one, how do we create a space for those women to have a voice? And my question number two, why or when did corporate law supersede fundamental basic human rights in Indigenous law? Why, is, why does development move forward at no matter no what cost that displaces people, not just Indigenous people, we see the homeless and so forth. And so this is what my work now um, centers on. And this is all interconnected to uh, climate change in, in big ways, particularly when we are chained to a global economy that is trying to operate as it always has done. And um, I'll leave it there because um, when we talk about climate change and we talk about the global economy, we're all tied to that. And, you know, I think we should take a deeper analytical lens even to the war that's happening in Ukraine. What is that all about? Let's look, and what about all of the wars that are happening uh, throughout the, you know, throughout the, um, the globe, around the globe? And a lot of it is tied to these economy at the expense of fundamental basic human rights and particularly the rights of indigenous people and indigenous women and two-spirited, uh, what, what we call two-spirited here in Canada uh, and LGBTQ plus people. So I'll just leave it there, thanks. Thank you, Sherry, and I think the next question for 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 Nathy will kind of also link well with with your um, intervention. So, Nathy, para la segunda ronda, eh, la pregunta so, para Nathy, for the next question. The question is: We're going to focus more on the issues that women face in your territory. So, in terms of your experience. What has the defense of life and territory meant for women? And if you can add to this, what would be the necessary changes to improve the women's living conditions? Thank you. Thank you for the question. In Guatemala, the defense of land and territory for women has meant a lack of security. This can be as a result of the presence of military members or police, national police or regional police. Women are subject to rape, to harassment. And the women who have been at the front lines of the fight for life and for nature have had to go into exile. And that breaks down not only the community, but families as well. Therefore, it's a very complex and complicated situation. And it's a very painful situation. For example, when there's flooding or where there are landslides, those things are all connected. It's all part of climate change. And as I previously mentioned, it affects our territories more than others, and it's women 
more often in the home. So if there is a landslide, they're at greater risk. And women in our society are assigned certain roles, and this puts them even at greater risk. And what I've seen in terms of the work I do with women in the community is that we urgently need greater participation on the part of women. We need women to be able to participate in the decision-making process. Society has imposed certain roles on women, but also women can sometimes internalize those assigned roles. So we think that we're not capable of learning other things, that only men can do certain things. For example, learning how to swim, going out of the house, of going to social gatherings or taking certain decisions or leadership roles in the community. So that's an obstacle that we've been facing, but it's urgent for women to participate in the decision-making process, and that will help to change the situation that women are experiencing. For example, equity and equality, it will help to change and improve our participation and in terms of decision making. And as women, we need to create those conditions because it's not something that they're going to give us. We need to create the conditions of equality. That's something that women need. We also need to empower women, we need to empower ourselves. And we also need to work with children from a very early age so that we can analyze a variety of situations. So for example, education that treats girls and boys in an equal way, to have a holistic view of education that doesn't focus on assigned roles for men and women, because those become obstacles for us. If we can take into account our rights if we, we can begin to participate and if we can have a different mentality, that will help to change our current, the current conditions that we live in. We need to eliminate those obstacles. We need to overcome those obstacles that have been imposed on us as well as the obstacles that are imagined that for example, that a capitalistic system has imposed on us. These, there are many obstacles that we need to face in our day-to-day. -day. And also looking at the details of how this plays out in our daily lives, we need to break down the fears that we have. For example, the fear of what will people say if I participate? Because it's something new it's different, and so society looks at it negatively. For example, where I currently live, we want to achieve parity, so e equality, equal representation and participation in social structures and organizations within the community. And so we want more women to become involved in the drinking water community, in the environmental community that addresses issues with pollution. And we want to see greater participation of women in these communities. But in order to do that, we need to increase awareness amongst the men so that they have a better understanding. Because here in our community, it's the women who go and plant vegetables, who are working in the fields, who are working with maize and corn. And so we need to have greater understanding on the part of men and women also have to overcome those assigned roles to go beyond the family and to be active within the community. 
it's essential for us, for women to take on that responsibility and at the time overcome that fear. And to overcome that fear, we need a lot of training, education, awareness and support. And we'll only be able to achieve that if we're able to participate in different kinds of spaces. We need to empower women. That's a very important part of the process. And as I previously mentioned, we also need to be part of the decision-making process. That's the only way that we can change those social roles that have been imposed on us so that we can see each other as human beings and see these responsibilities as shared responsibilities, not just a man and a woman in their roles in the family, but also in the community. We are just as responsible for our lives. And here I'm not referring only to human beings. I'm also thinking about nature, how we take care of the environment and nature. That way we can have clean air pure air, clean water, if we're able to be aware of our responsibility to take care of Mother Nature. So there's, well, there's a need for everyone to see that they have a responsibility, that we have a responsibility my responsibility is to take care of the nature around me. And it's also important to be able to name those large companies and extractive industries that are polluting and destroying nature. And how I said this in the previous response, in the case of Guatemala, the indigenous communities are the ones that are suffering the most as a result of climate change. Therefore, we need to continue fighting and we need to continue working with education with young children so that young girls can grow up with that awareness of equality and equity in order to have a better future and in order to help the future generations and in terms of our ancestors, it stands out for me when they say that we're currently living the results of the actions of our ancestors, actions that they took hundreds of years ago. So right now, what motivates me is to fight for future generations. And I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you so much, Nati. Thank you for that reminder that we need to take care of each other and that we all share the responsibility. And it, it's linked to what Sherry was saying. It's women need to be part of the decision-making processes. From your experience, what are some of the strategies that you've, you've, you've seen and you've, um, you've experienced and, and you've, you've You've worked on uh, with Indigenous women strategies to address these impacts? Um, well, I think um, one is really, um, I've always believed that when we speak of education, awareness building, capacity development, this is something that should be continuous. You know? um, it's, it's not a one, uh, one time, big time thing. So I think one of the very important strategy is the continuing capacity development for indigenous peoples um, in their communities and especially for um, uh, indigenous women. So when we speak of capacity building, we would, this would include really um, understanding. I mean, what are our rights as indigenous peoples? What are our rights as indigenous people, uh, as indigenous women? What are the mechanisms available for us to be able to, to access um, justice or to be able to um, to bring out uh, our thoughts in relation to certain um, activities or projects that government would uh, bring into our 
communities. And of course, capacity development would also include, you know, enhancing um, our skills in terms of being leaders ourselves, being how do we articulate um, our issues uh, to be able to, to, to gather the support or understanding of the wider public. Um, how do we deal with um, government officials? How do we manage our, our, our organizations? And these are things that I think uh, is very important. Um, of course, too, is still um, many indigenous um, peoples are, are either organized as communities and in many occasions or in many instances, they also form um, their own organizations, you know, as women, as youth, or uh, as elders. Um, we should still continue such um, uh, organizing and building and strengthening um, our organizations and our, our, our communities. And that would also include um, not only building it and making it stronger, but we should be able also to expand, you know, and reach out to to other um, communities and other organizations, not only um, indigenous peoples, but also um, other organizations uh, who can advocate, you no, know, for our issues, who could advocate for a better um, situation. And I think the third one would be. Um, depending probably on how strong, how big, and the level of support that uh, we get from um, uh, from others would be uh, the continuing actions that we we should be able to to do. No, so there's uh, I mean there's many forms that we can do, um, ranging from probably doing direct actions to also engaging um, our government through existing um, mechanisms and uh, there's also a wide range of how do we engage these uh, many intergovernmental um, processes no? not only with the un but probably also looking into um, mechanisms where we are able to to engage no? with those that provide the financing for all of these um, development projects that we uh, that we are confronted with in our um, communities and uh, of course part of the reaching out will be the fourth one will be how do we build um uh, solidarity you no know? mutual support how do we build um partnerships how do we build um cooperations not only among indigenous peoples but with with other uh, sections of society and this might probably also include um working with uh uh engaging with governments that are um what how do you say supportive or champions for um indigenous people's rights and maybe to also to a certain extent working with um private sector who are genuinely um espousing or um practicing not not only at the minimum corporate social um responsibilities and those that are willing to to work with us. I think these are strategies <laughs> that we have been employing um, for several years, several decades now, and it has proven to be to be effective. And uh, depending probably on our experience, this can be um, further en enhanced. No? Um, and uh, it can also, pro uh, in the case of indigenous peoples, would be I think a strategy that uh, has worked in is how do we inter what's the term? I'm thinking in Tagalog. I mean, um, uh, our our spirituality, our indigenous practices and, and traditions. How are these put into uh, use? You no, know, in a situation wherein we are confronted, like we you know, big dams uh, and all of this. Um, so. Probably um, a very good experience in our case here in the Philippines is the role of the elders. And I think that's also the same no? with other indigenous peoples, like probably even the First Nations in, in, in Canada or the US. Um, the elders uh, played a very important role in unifying the community in relation to an, a common issue that they are facing, in building a better understanding of the issues and how do we fight um, to protect or to assert our rights as uh, indigenous peoples. 
I mean, I think those are proven strategies <laughs> um, that we have employed um, through the years. Well, at the beginning, you were talking a, um, a bit about a campaign around, uh, around fighting for our future. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and how that employs these different strategies and, you know. Um, mm -hmm. um, yes, thank you, Rachel. Before I forget, I, I just remembered that I think one of the per particularities of indigenous peoples uh, as a matter of strategy is building consensus, um, building um, unity. And I have observed, you know, in my experience as an indigenous activist, that really when it comes to indigenous peoples, it really takes time, no? Um, and I've seen that it can have, it, it, it's not a one-time big time thing, like uh, it, it involves, you know, going back to the communities every now and then to, to, to explain and get their, um, unity and i've seen also elders sit down until the wee hours of the of the day to you know to 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 bring out and discuss uh, all of these issues i think so that's one strategy that really we can work with, uh, with i mean dealing with all of these issues that we are confronted with the 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 what you call the importance of of unity and consensus building now um going back to your to your question um, the International Indigenous Peoples Movement for Self-Determination and Liberation, um, which uh, was founded in way back in 2010. Now, relatively, we are a new organization. Um, for this year, we have launched what we call a, uh, a year-long uh, campaign and probably more than a, a year. And we call it um, the future uh, and fight for our future. So this involves answering the question, not only what is the future we want, no, but it goes beyond that. Not what is the future that we are fighting for? Um, because in, in reality, um, the things that we want, the things that we aspire, us, aspire for, I mean, does not fall from the ground. It's not also handed to us uh, on a silver a silver platter or handed uh, spoon fed to uh, to us by by governments, by private sector, by corporations. And it is something that we need to assert. It is something that we need to to fight for. So this uh, the fighting for fight for our future is also a campaign wherein it will allow us. Um, indigenous peoples, indigenous women, indigenous youth, to be able to articulate um, the alternative uh, that we want, no, no? an alternative that is respective of um, diversity, an alternative that is respective of our rights, um, an alternative that will also enhance the participation of indigenous peoples uh, in wider society. It is an alternative that uh, that would um, bring about genuine development, not only for indigenous peoples, but also for the uh, the state or the country that we um, find ourselves in. So it will answer, try to answer um, four elements, no, of the future that we are fighting for. One, one is in relation to uh, fight for our lands. No? And this would include um, fighting for the right to self-determination, um, at the minimum, fighting for our right to free prior informed consent for any activity that is done in our communities or, or lands or any activity that would impact on us. Two is fighting for our planet. And this would uh, include uh, fighting for the environment. You know? uh, three will be fighting for our health. And a very important aspect of this will be uh, fighting for social services that, uh, that we deserve. You know? that, that, uh, because despite our contribution to national wealth because of the extraction of resources from our lands and territories, we remain to be socially neglected in terms of education, in terms of health and other social services. And of course, the fourth will be fighting for our rights. And uh, this would include 
um, uh, rights, not only as indigenous peoples, but freedoms also as uh, human beings. So if we are able to respond to this, uh, we hope that this um, fighting for our future would lead to a self-determined and sustainable um, society wherein we are able to enjoy a, a healthy, free, and just society for indigenous peoples and other peoples uh, uh, in the world. So that's our uh, campaign. We need to fight for our future. Thanks um, to our panelists. There's uh, a lot to say. Um, my head is kind of spinning because there's so many things um, that our panelists have talked about. Um, and for this, going into this uh, last round of discussions, um, our panelists have touched on issues such as the interconnected nature of um, local communities uh, to air, to land, to water and fire, um, the lack of control over territories, exploitation of land in resource extraction, and the complacency of justice, uh, justice systems and the performative nature uh, of power systems uh, in justifying the minimal inclusiveness of women, um, but also how women have taken the lead in protecting their territories and breaking barriers to ensure, um, you know, securing just economic conditions for themselves, not only for themselves, but also for their communities. So for this uh, last round of questions, um, I will ask the panelists sort of a two-part question as we wind down and I will begin with Natalia. Um, just to talk about how, you know, indigenous and Afro-descendant women, they ground themselves in both um, individual and with a collective. And the consideration of traditional knowledge is a source of power. Um, but these strategies and these aspects are, however, often overlooked. Um, what are some good practices or strategies uh, that you can share with us that would further strengthen Indigenous women's capacity in Guatemala to identify, to identify um, for their collective rights? And if you have any recommendations that you can share with us for um, further amplifying your work. Bueno, muchas gracias. Um, Thank you for the question. I think there are several stra strategies that can be implemented. One strategy is to accompany women in the, in the process of understanding and getting to know what their rights are. And as far as they are familiar with what their rights are, they can defend those rights. However, to do that, we need to create the right conditions. Women have certain societal roles, for example, being at home, in charge of the food. Then there's a series of chores that we have to do, but we need to create conditions so that women are able to go to meetings and to gatherings. If they're not able to go to these meetings and gatherings, then they won't be able to learn about their rights. For example, those workshops or meetings have to take place at a time when women can participate. The problem is that when women fight and when they're in, on the front lines, that they're often on the front lines, but you, often they don't have time to participate in meetings or workshops. It's also another strategy is for women to be able to identify the kind of violence perpetrated against them. That will help women to be able to defend their rights as well. Another strategy is to create public policies that support the conditions that enable women to participate in a variety of spaces, for example, in municipal, regional, and national spaces. We need the participation of women and we need women to be involved in decision making. We also need men to listen to women and to really consider what women are saying. It would be useless for women to participate if men are not listening. 
and considering what women are saying. And therefore, we also need to create those conditions so that men are listening to women's proposals. Another strategy is to create awareness about laws that protect women and to help women learn about the laws that punish those who commit violence against women. Another strategy is to create and promote laws that strengthen women's rights. In Guatemala, we've suffered very serious things and attacks, for example, March 8th, when 42 girls were murdered. And this year, March 8th, a law was approved or a bill was approved by the Congress. And it's a bill that criminalizes women in cases of involuntary abortion. So on March 8th, women were already suffering from the pain for the murder of the girl of the girls. And on top of that, they were punished by the state with the passing of this bill. So every day as women, we need to be stronger in order to defend our rights. And in a lot of circumstances, it's the state that limits and reduces our rights as women. And as women, we need to become stronger through our strategies and not only through our capacities, and, but also through our organizations in order to continue defending our rights. Another strategy is to overcome obstacles and to create awareness amongst the population in general. Awareness about the impacts on Mother Nature and on the environment in order to improve our well being. There are a lot of tasks and a lot of things that need to be done in order to in order to create a situation where we can prosper and thrive, not only for women, but for everyone. We need to look for a better future for women and for future generations, as well as for our biodiversity. Therefore, the the government needs to also work with children so that children can become familiar with their rights. And so that the youth are aware of their rights, of what they need in order to thrive and for there to be no more discrimination, discrimination, gender discrimination or discrimination against indigenous communities. We need the governments to put forth public policies that enable the participation of women. We also need awareness about the risks that women face in society. And that way we can have, there can be women who experience a life free of violence, who have access to safety. And it's women's lives that are most at risk. So something I think about is how countries like in Guatemala, how in our fight, how we can work and collaborate and support each other, come together in so solidarity with other countries, with Canada, for example, how we can join hands in order to attain justice, to fight for women's rights, to achieve equality, well being, and to protect 
the lives of future generations and to protect the life of our mother nature, which gives us life. So another strategy is to join forces and support each other in our work against climate change and the climate crisis. We can also As women, we can work together. We can work together to create change. We can create change in our contexts, in our communities. We can fight for nature, and we can also fight for peace. And we would like to live a life without violence. We would like to live a life of equality. And I hope that we can achieve it by implementing different strategies and that's why exchanges are so important or events like today's are important because it can help us to move forward with our strategies to defend life and to defend mother nature thank you thank you so much natalia um uh, and i'm glad that you mentioned that you know, empowerment cannot be stressed enough um, and, the, and the collaborations between countries, be, between communities, and also the mention um, of a justice system um, that, you know, it, it, it grudgingly gives with one hand and takes away with the other. Um, so I'd like to move now to Dr. Pictou, um, you know, as follow-up, talking about empowerment of women. Uh, this is linked to the earth, uh, to the territory, to natural resources. But you know, you also raised important questions about how, about why the right to life, the rights to protect territory is trumped over by capitalism, um, is met with criminalization and the voices of women and indigenous communities is, is ignored. Um, so I know that asking about strategies and how to address these challenges is loaded, uh, but I'm just wondering if you can share a little bit um, about your perspective perspectives of, on this and, and some of your recommendations as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. Uh, yes, I was looking at this question and, uh, you know, the resilience of Indigenous women in struggle is just to be applauded. And, you know, as a strategy, as difficult as it is, I think we have to strive for truth. We have to strive for the reality. And I've been very fortunate to work with Kairos in, in this respect. Um, for instance, there was two sets of, um, there was two groups of grandmothers here in the East, uh, the Wallistic, the beautiful river people, as they refer to themselves, were fighting against a mine in their ancestral territories. And there was the Mi'kmaq grandmothers who was fighting against Alton, a company called Alton Gas. And without half, getting into all the details of it, uh, in both cases, there was environmental concerns and even the environmental assessments. And I, I with, with Kairos, we helped to create a space for those women to tell their stories. And you'll find this on the Mother Earth Resource Extraction uh, website, the um, Stories of Courage. And furthermore, we've been working with Kairos to make those uh, international linkages of what uh, some of my uh, co-panelists have talked about. And out of those, we've learned so much, even about, particularly about Canadian mining companies, the, the ones that we're fighting here. And I did see a note earlier about the concern about what we call the ring of fire in Northern Ontario, which is a deep concern. Uh, here you have First Nations communities without access to safe drinking water. And yet there's this hyper intensive resource extraction industry taking place in what they call this ring of, ring of fire. And so uh, the work needs to continue to connect those stories. And why I say that as a strategy is because we need the counter narrative, but not just the counter narrative that I find that within the process of struggle, there's so much 
resurgence of our indigenous ways of knowing and particularly the roles that indigenous women play and two spirited people as well. And that resurgence of that, that, and, and why is that so important? It's because um, from what I can gather, though there's different contexts, they offer life. They offer a very balanced life of living without destroying the earth uh, that that really supports those ecosystems that in turn supports the water and support and support the um, support the our sources of food. So creating space and continuing on with the struggle. And, the, and, and I know in some countries, this is a courageous move because we've lost so many indigenous women activists and so forth. Uh, second, to kind of echo some of Beverly's uh, concerns about the law and human rights and so forth, I think we have to really struggle to highlight some of these injustices and to show just how the corporate wor uh, world is up here and human rights and indigenous rights are down here. There's this hierarchy. And, and, and why is that? It's not a matter of competing rights. It's uh, just competing rights. It's a matter of one set of rights that are, la that are privileged at the expense of others, not to mention the rights of mother earth herself. Um, a third um, area that I'm trying to work on is this notion here in Canada that the government use of gender-based analysis. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, gender-based analysis just becomes a check mark for equality, not necessarily equity. And I know many of you would know what I mean by that. And I'm very concerned, why, why does this concern me? Because I see it starting to pop up in the federal government's uh, mandates and in, in regarding indigenous people, oh, we'll do a gender-based analysis and everything will be okay. Well, what is also happening, we have the missing and murdered indigenous women's final inquiry report. And I do believe that Rachel put a, a, a link in the chat to that. And there's 20, 231 recommendations for a consents concise uh, or more condensed um, view, uh, I would recommend looking at the um, the executive summary or the call or the, the, the calls to justice. And in that was a, I was a little bit hesitancy because they called for social economic impact assessments. I'm a little bit worried about that because where's the environmental? assessment in that and is this will this be an attempt to try to include women in that neoliberal or capitalist paradigm as opposed to transforming it so i'm a little bit concerned so i'm hoping to uh to engage with indigenous women and try to figure out how can we do a gender-based analysis from our perspective, from an indigenous perspective, and then stage two, how can that influence the decision-making processes? And in my capacity as this honorary district chief, I've been, uh, I've been hinting at the leadership that this is the work that I'm hoping to do, and I'm starting to see some positive movement. And the last thing what I will say is that is with these sustainable development goals that we need to unpack them. And what do they really mean? There's so many contradictions with the sustainable development goals. And for example, we have the big blue economy now, which pertains to oceans. Does that translate into sustainable development again or is that just another mechanism to exploit and I can't see how you can exploit from the ocean but to really look at those and particularly uh, SDG 5 when we talk about oh we're going to include women we're going to include gender to make sure that we include SDG 5. Those are some amongst many and I do see Jane put her uh, <laughs> photo on so I know we're running out of time but those are some of the more concrete things that I can think of. Um, and so thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pictou. I wish we had more time. 
you know, because these are really, really important um, issues that you raise. Um, and there's a lot to unpack there, uh, like you mentioned. Um, I will now go next to uh, Beverly's um, uh, last comments uh, on the video. We seem to have lost uh, connection with Chantal, but um, if we're able to reconnect again, uh, perhaps she will have some time to share um, her last comments. Uh, but now over to Beverly. So I guess the, the, the last question is really around sort of um, advocacy and action and recommendations you would like us uh, to bring forward to the international community and uh, to the Canadian government uh, in order to support these strategies, in order to address some of these impacts that you talked about? Um. I think in terms of uh, uh, recommendations, uh, one, you know, I still remember Rachel, um, the first time I was in Canada, I think that was uh, through your invitation where we had this meeting on women and mining. And I think at that time, uh, the, the continuing lobby for a, uh, what do you call this, a Canada um, goods person uh, for responsible um, uh, for mining. And that was a good campaign. And I, I think that we were able to get that. Unfortunately, in terms of the, the role of the ombudsperson has much been um, watered down. So uh, our call for the um, uh, Canadian um, government is really to uh, look into the, what they call this, giving more teeth, no? on the role of the uh, ombudsperson because uh, uh, there are many um, Canadian mines no, operating in indigenous people's territories, um, not only here in Asia, but also in different parts of the world. So a mechanism wherein we are able to bring out our grievances, our experiences, as far as the operations of Canadian mining and being able, and this mechanism, the ombudsperson being able to um, investigate no? uh, allegations of human rights abuses, including free, uh, a violation of free prior and for consent would be uh, a very good uh, way of uh, bringing out your so-called um, integrity and uh, support for indigenous peoples and the uh, environment. Um, we have also been, uh, what do you call this, um, part and being supportive of the continuing um, campaign of our brothers and sisters First Nations on the missing, murdered um, indigenous women, uh, disappeared indigenous women and, uh, and girls. And uh, I understand that a report has been brought out uh, in relation to this and the several, more than 200 uh, recommendations have been uh, put forward in this so-called um, calls for justice. I hope the Canadian government would seriously look into these um, recommendations and implement no, um, these uh, recommendations, especially looking into the core of the experience uh, in terms of colonization, discrimination against um, the First Nations being uh, a root of uh, uh, all of this. Um, Probably in terms of the uh, 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 the wider the uh, public, um, we have recently concluded the COP, the Conference of Parties, uh, 26 in, in in Glasgow, Scotland. We're in again several recommendations, several declarations um, came out, and there was one specifically for um, indigenous peoples and the uh, uh, local um, communities that uh, uh, promised. Uh, providing uh, resources no, for indigenous peoples. One, uh, we look at this as a very good um, development, a recognition or a response to how many years of struggle for indigenous peoples. But at the same time, we are uh, also concerned uh, that the funds might not go to indigenous peoples uh, themselves and might probably even go to other formations or platforms that would promote so-called community-based and uh, what you call these natural-based solutions, uh, but this basically greenwashing all of these um, disruptive um, 
uh, practices. So we hope that these funds um, will go directly to indigenous um, communities for them to be able to manage and use. And of course, giving um, special consideration for indigenous women who are uh, more than or uh, more more likely to be left out in all in all of these um, uh, processes. Um, in specifically for the Philippines, um, since uh, for several years now, we have been um, uh, lobbying the United Nations Human Rights Council to to support no uh what they call this uh, an independent uh investigation on the human rights situation in the philippines to look into not only drug related killings but all these cases especially of rep tagging political vilification criminalization that has also led to the killing of uh, of activists or or dissenters and or or if not uh, if or those many of us also have been you know um incarcerated detained due to trump up um, charges and many of the victims by this um practice of uh, criminalization are indigenous people so we hope that the canadian government and of course all other members of the, the uh, human rights council will still support our call uh, for a resolution to to visit the philippines and uh, of course this is very very important uh, because uh, on may uh, we will be holding our national elections wherein we are going to elect a new president and new members of uh, the parliament and other local um, government officials um, maybe um uh, a last word um uh, rachel um you know, I, you were mentioning a while ago about building back up uh, better and I've come out with I think three three points uh, on this. Uh, one will be uh, definitely it uh, it will involve the the full, effective, and meaningful participation of indigenous peoples, and in our case, no um, indigenous uh, women, because we really cannot build back better without um, indigenous peoples and indigenous uh, women. Women. We might be a minority in terms of population. Uh, we might be a minority in terms of political influence because of our status as uh, discriminated people. But um, you know, you can never have environmental or economic um, security, as our theme would say, without our full, effective, and meaningful participation. And two will be really when we speak of building back better, we should be able to, to review what are the existing um, policies or principles that has governed our economic, political, and social cultural um, um, relations and, and positions. And I think in a situation of uh, oppression, in a situation of uh, repression, this um, cannot be. We have to, to review and look back into the implementation and operation of these neoliberal policies being brought about by big capitalist and imperialist countries. And definitely we have seen that uh, these um, uh, policies uh, that they are dictating on um, has not benefited much of the people, but in fact has contributed to much of this climate and environmental destruction. And third now, we are in a situation where in, um, it's not only an issue of you know, fighting over profits. We are now in a situation where in these big imperialist and capitalist countries are fighting in terms of, of influence. And this has reached a, a situation where in, it's not only a simple uh, war for profits, but it's a, it's, an, uh, it's a war. <laughs> and we are seeing what's happening in, in Eastern Europe with the, the developments in Ukraine and, and, and Russia. And of course, in, in Asia, we have also seen the flexing of, of China, of its uh, military might over va uh, its, uh, what do you call this, um, over the West Philippine Sea. So in other words, it, the, 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 there's a great possibility that these contradictions will escalate into something like a, a war. 
and this is a war wherein majority of the people including indigenous peoples you know the workers the, the peasants the farmers the women and the have nothing to do uh, to do with it no so it is in this uh, point that when we also build back better we should be able to be put in the forefront the issue of peace no so um while it's true we are in a pandemic <laughs> it's a health a situation of health but when we speak also of um, building back better it should also be in a very important aspect of peace because we do not want a situation for in these wars between big countries capitalist countries will further push us into um, poverty and uh, marginalization so Um, so, in the interest of time, um, I want to thank uh, Chantal, uh, Dr. Pictou, Natalia, and Beverly for being part of this discussion. I think that um, there was and there is a lot to build on, um, a lot of learning and experiences that, um, uh, you know, learning from the experiences that we have, the participation of women and security approaches and how these are linked to, uh, to climate and the environment and recognizing the problems of militarization, um, extractive capitalist systems, the complacency of the justice sector, but also how we can challenge these systems to do better, to be better and be more supportive of the growing global models of gender justice, be it in climate, um, environmental and economic justice. I appreciate the active participation of participants. Thank you for being here for sharing your thoughts and asking your questions. Unfortunately, we do not have time to go into that, but um, we'll definitely share this with the panelists and we will share their responses um, in the mail out after the, after the workshop. I will now invite Rachel uh, Warden to lead the last part of our workshop. Rachel. Um, hi everybody. And, and, and uh, thank you so much for that, that rich discussion and, um, Thank you, um, panelists, for the recommendations and strategies and advocacy priorities moving forward. These must lead our work. They're integral to our work. And uh, I mean, in the world, words of panelists, um, why are these strategies so important? Um, because they offer life and life uh, uh, in all forms. Um, and they defend life. Uh, and this is all, all types of life. And they build back better and they build back better with peace and peace that includes um, the environment and includes uh, includes other creatures, includes the planet. Um, so we take, encourage everyone to take these strategies and recommendations and, and bring them forward to governments and, international, and internationally. I wanted to just take a minute to talk about an action that Kairos is working on in Canada um, right now. Um, and we are calling on the Canadian government to increase funding to women peace builders. And by women peace builders, we mean um, the women on this panel uh, and other women human rights defenders uh, uh, who are working to build sustainable, inclusive, equitable peace with environmental and economic justice. Uh, these are the women who are defending life and this is life, all life and, and peace building for all life and for the planet. Um, uh, so, uh, specifically, what we're calling on the government, uh, what we're calling on the government to do is to increase overseas development assistance to reach its international standard by the year 2030. So this includes increasing it this year, meeting international climate commitments, and ensuring that funding, this funding actually reaches these grassroots women's organizations and peace and peace uh, peace groups. Uh, I just want to take the last minute to thank everyone who participated in, in the workshop. Again, thank you. Uh, thank you to the panelists, to Natty and Bev, and Sherry and Chantal uh, for your time, for sharing your experiences and, and knowledge and expertise and for deepening our understanding of this nexus between peace, uh, security, gender, environment, and climate justice for broadening our, our understanding of security and grounding that in, in, in your context and, and your experience. You showed her so, so clearly that this isn't a theoretical concept. It's discovered by policymakers and funders. It's what women built, peace builders, land defenders are living and working on right now. Um, 
thank you for defending life, all life, and building peace, real peace, uh, with, with climate justice. Uh, I want to thank the partnership team and my colleagues, um, Gabriella, Jane, uh, Radia, for all the work you do and your commitment to partnerships and, and the program and advocacy led by partners and for facilitating this rich discussion. A special shout out and thank you to Jane Tarika for leading and hosting us and bringing us together with such skill and grace. Um, thanks for all the, the tech team and all the people behind the scenes translating. Thank you to the translators. Um, thank you to the volunteers and Kyra staff for all, all, all the work behind the scenes uh, in this workshop. And uh, thank you to all of you who came out uh, and um, from wherever, wherever you're connecting to, uh, from your various organizations or, and, and also governments. And thank you for any representatives of the Canadian government who are here. Um, and thank you uh, everyone for, for your interest, for your support and continuing to fight for, uh, for life, for life and to defend life uh, and to support the work of, of women peace builders and uh, land defenders and environmental defenders. So thank you again for, for being with us.